So as always, we <clears throat> look solely to the Word of God for our instruction, uh, explanation, um, and that is the only authority we have, ultimately, is the Word of God. And because it is the Word of God, it is... It is written that we might understand, but we know that we cannot fully grasp the things of God. He is incomprehensible. And I really love the last hymn that we sang, speaking of some of these aspects of God and, and the realities of, of what he is. <clears throat> but we've been looking at trying to have a sense of, of what God is like over the last few weeks, the nature of God. And we will begin moving towards some of the attributes where God then exercises these things. And we've talked about that God is self-existent. He has always existed. He was not created. There has never been a time, if you could say there is such a thing as time outside of this world, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, God is sovereign. Uh, and uh, he is Lord over all things, uh, even the weather. Praise God for that. But... but um, we talked about his self-existence and, and to try to have a sense of this, this God who has always been, that everything proceeds from him. Everything owes its existence to him. There was a time when he was alone in the three persons of the Godhead that only he existed. And so we're seeing him as being self-existent, as being self-sufficient. He had no need. He did not create out of need. He didn't say, well, I'm I'm lacking something, therefore I'm going to create. He said he created out of his own good pleasure to display his glory, that God is completely self-sufficient in himself. We can neither add anything to nor take any way, anything away from God. We have ultimately really no effect on God. God is completely holy. We talked about that last week, that, that he is... He is completely distinct from us. He is not like us. He is in a category all of his own that, that he, um, he does not share that fully with anyone. There is no one who can be as God. There is nothing that competes because, again, everything came from God, all creation, every aspect of it. And in that holiness, he is absolutely perfect and pure and without any stain that that he is absolutely righteous. And so in, in thinking about who God is and what his nature is, and to try to have some sense of what God is like, we come to something that, that I think is, is really a cornerstone for us to, to, to do our best to get a hold of, and that is because of all these things that God is, he is the absolute ruler over everything. There is nothing that can compete with God. He is completely sovereign. Sovereignty just simply means supreme authority or power. It's the right to act and it's the power to carry it out. So a true sovereign has both the right or the authority and he has the power <clears throat> to carry out what his office says that he can do. And in God's case, this is not theoretical. It's actual because there will be people who have the authority or the right, but they don't always have the power. And there are people who have power in the world, but they don't necessarily have the right or the authority to act on that. But God is sovereign. He is the supreme authority, and he is the supreme power. He completely rules over everything. So the scripture verse, Psalm 103, 19, tells us, that the Lord has established his throne. So he is the one who made it. He established it. He determined this. I am God. He sits on a throne, which obviously represents rule and authority, um, kingship, the head of all things. All things bow before that throne. So he says, it says that the Lord has established his throne in the heavens, his sovereignty rules over all so we might just think so what is all well all is all and that's all all means but all he rules over all he is the supreme authority 
and he is the supreme power. That is really, there is really nothing that can contest that, and that's what we saw in Psalm 2 as we looked at, the, looked at those who, who would rise up against him and, and want to throw off his, his, the fetters and the, the restraints that, that God would place on them. So what is the position, first of all, that God holds? Where do we see his sovereignty and his rule over everything? Well, first of all, we look at him as creator. He is sovereign in all of creation. And Genesis 1 tells us that, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So when there was such a thing you could call the beginning, he was already there prior to that. It was his idea. It was his genius. It was his creative power that brought everything into being. <clears throat> so no matter how grand a scale it might be, into the, the outer reaches of the universe, or whether it goes down to molecular biology and the, the smallest details, the atoms, the molecules, the, the tiniest particles of existence of everything that is, God is the one who made that. He is the only one who understands it. He's the only one that has the right to rule over it. All of creation is God's because there was a time when there was not, and God said, let there be, and everything came in to existence. So first of all, he is sovereign over all creation. He's the owner of it. He is the governor of it. He's the one who can say what is and what is not. Besides being just the creator of it, he's also the sustainer of the universe. You know, there is a this fairly popular at the, the time of the foundation of, of America, um, <clears throat> a theology just called deism, that God exists, we believe he is there, he has created everything, but then once he created it, he, he just kind of turned it loose to, to function on its own and the principles that he established. So God, in other words, didn't interfere, he didn't intervene, he didn't interact with his creation. And so the, the logical man would say, well, Obviously, something put this all together, you know, and, and Romans 1 tells us that, that, that even though they knew he was God, they refused to acknowledge him as God. And so deism is the idea that, yes, God exists, but he doesn't govern, he doesn't rule, he doesn't, he doesn't determine the things that go on within his creation. But Hebrews 1 says, and he upholds all things by the word of his power, that everything that is in the creation is still run and governed and maintained by the authority of God. He has not removed himself from creation. He sustains it. He upholds it. He is the one to, 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 that determines it. And, you know, we were told but when, when Noah was told that, that as long as man exists, you know, that, that there will be, be heat and cold and summer and winter and so forth and seed time and harvest and God is the one who makes all that happens. He sustains everything. He is involved actively in his creation. So therefore, when we think about well, when things occur, let's say weather events, for instance, was God in control of that? Was God sovereign over that? Is, was this something that God just turned loose and, and now the havoc that's, that's wreaked by this thing is, is just because that's the way the forces of nature work? Or is God actively still administering over his creation? He's the creator. He made it, designed it, knows it, owns it, rules it. He continues to uphold all things by the word of his power. So therefore, he is also the ruler over everything. That means, again, he's taking an active part in determining what is going on in the world. Psalm 47 says, for God is the king of all the earth. He's the king. He rules it. He is the only sovereign. There is none other. And in Daniel, there's some beautiful statements about, about the rule of God and the kingdom that will be given to the son of man. And he says, your dominion is an everlasting dominion. You own it. You are the ruler. There is no one. Again, as Psalm 2 tells us, no one can compete with the rule, with the authority, with the power of God. He created, he sustains, he governs and rules over everything that is from the beginning until he brings everything to a conclusion. And that brings us to the thought of God being the judge 
of all mankind, that he is the sovereign over, over man and man's relationship to him. You know, uh, Abraham asked God when looking down over Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, will the judge of all the earth not do right? Will you wipe away the righteous along with the unrighteous? And, and Abraham continued to ask, well, what if there's 50? What if there's 45? What if there's 40, 30, 20? And, and God said, yes, but God is still the judge. And when he could not find even one righteous besides Job, I mean, besides uh, Lot, he destroyed the city. He is the judge. He will bring all things to a conclusion. Everyone has to answer to God. Hebrews 9 tells us that when it says it's appointed for men to die once, and then after this comes judgment. Judgment of what? Judgment based upon what? Judgment by whom? By God himself. In fact, by Christ. He is the ultimate judge, and everyone will be judged according to the deeds that they carried out in the flesh. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of whom, of him with whom we have to do. Or another translation is of him with whom, to whom we must give an account. Everyone comes before God as judge. Revelation 14 and he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and springs of water. The hour of judgment has come. There is a time that all of us have to stand before the judge. And he's sovereign over that. He makes the rules. He dictates the terms. We cannot approach him from some different viewpoint from, from a, uh, a negotiation point of view. No, he dictates the terms. He knows the fullness of all truth. There is nothing that is hidden from his eyes, and all of us have to answer to the judge. So God is sovereign in creation. He is sovereign in his sustaining and, and, and administration of the physical environment. He is the ruler not only of nature, but over all men, all nations, all affairs of people. And one day he will call all people to account as the judge. So God, in all respects, is supreme. Superior, in other words, to all others in his authority, in his power, in his status, and in every way. God is absolutely supreme. Isaiah 45 says, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. There is no other. There's no other way whereby we must be saved except through Christ. He is the only God, and there is only one way to relate to this God. Psalm 113 says, the Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heaven and in the earth? God, in a, again, we're picturing him in a, in a human uh, aspect, which is impossible, but, but to try to have a sense of how God relates to the, to the entire universe, he has to bow down even to look upon heaven and earth. This God that is so elevated, enthroned on high, his glory is above the heavens. And then Paul tells us in 1 Timothy that he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the only sovereign, who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we use that term a lot. We hear it a lot in, uh, you know, in music and all that. But he is literally, you take all the kings ever that have, that have been and God is the one that rises above. He overrules all kings, all lords, all potentates of any kind, any president, whatever rule and authority there might be. He rules over them. He is the only sovereign. So we know that he is the sovereign over mankind. Isaiah 40 says it is he who sits above the circle of the earth. 
and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. All of mankind are like grasshoppers before God. And he sits above the circle of the earth looking down. He is sovereign over all men. And yet, Psalm 8 tells us, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? You know, again, we're putting these human-like qualities on God by talking about his fingers and so forth. But if you think about the creative power, what can you do with just your fingers? Only more delicate type of activities. You can't do heavy work with that. We have to use our entire bodies or get help. But God created the stars and everything, it says, just with his finger. I mean, what a small thing it is for God to create. And in fact, we know that God spoke everything into existence. So what David is saying is just the, the, the majesty, the glory, the, the immensity of God <clears throat> and all that he has done and all that he has created, the, the outer reaches of the universe that, that no man could ever know belong to God. And yet even that God has taken thought of man, that he knows us, that he has given us actually dominion over his world. But God is the one who determined that. I am Lord over all mankind. You're like grasshoppers to me. You're nothing before me. And yet my love for you has allowed you to know me. <clears throat> he is sovereign over all mankind. He's sovereign over kings and nations. As we've already seen And Daniel 2 says this, says, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. For wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. Who is in control? Who directs the affairs of nations, of, of governments, of empires? God removes kings. He establishes kings. He changes the times, the epics. The periods of history that we look at, God is the one who has orchestrated that. He is the absolute sovereign over any organized form of, of life that man can come up with. All civilization, all governments, there is nothing that man can do corporately that God still does not oversee and overrule according to his good pleasure. And Isaiah 40 says, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, a bucket with one little drop in it. That's what a nation is like. That's what a people group, that's what an empire is like before this God. One drop from a bucket. And they're regarded as just a speck of dust on the scale that you could not even see the scale move in the slightest by putting a speck of dust on it. And yet it says that the nations are regarded as no more than a speck of dust on the scales. And behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. All of the world is of no account to God. He rules over all mankind. He determines where they are. Paul tells us in Acts, when he's talking to the Athenians, that it is God who has established the, the, the limits of the habitations of man and where all the families will be. It's God who established that, who directed that, who put different people groups here and there. It was he who confused the people at the Tower of Babel because he said, I will determine how you're going to be and I'm going to send you throughout the world and, and, and your speech is not going to be understood by each other. It was God who dictates how man lives, where man lives, how long man lives, who rules, who reigns on the earth. Everything belongs to God in relation to mankind as a whole, relation to governments, kingdoms, nations, empires. It all belongs to God. But he's also sovereign over Satan. And this is a place where there are varying viewpoints and how we look at who Satan is and how Satan you know, acts in the world. And we know that he was cast to the world, that this was given, he was given dominion over this world. But again, he was given dominion 
over this world. It still doesn't belong to him. He does have a dominion and he has a right. And he even told Jesus that uh, in the wilderness, he said, if you'll bow down to me, I will give you these kingdoms because they are mine to give. That he has some authority. He does rule to some extent, but he is underneath the power and the authority of God. Martin Luther said, the devil is still God's devil. The devil is not independent. He does not have authority to do as he wants to do. He is still under the authority of Christ. In Luke 22, right before the crucifixion, Jesus said, Simon, Simon. And anytime you repeat something, it's really serious. And how many times did he say, verily, verily, or, or so forth. So he's calling, and, and he said that to Martha. Martha, Martha is like, really want to get your attention. He said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. So Satan comes. He wants to get Peter. Obviously, he knows the position that Peter has with the disciples and, 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 and the type of personality and whatever it might be about Peter. He wanted Peter. He wanted him. But he had to get permission. And Christ gave Satan permission to sift him. And we know what happened. He denied him three times. But that had to happen. Think of where Peter, now we can only imagine this, but imagine if Peter had never denied Christ three times. What would he have been like? What would his personality, what was his sense of, of, of self-confidence perhaps have been? He needed to be broken. He needed to be humbled. And yet Christ uses Satan who wants to destroy him. Let Satan have him for a period of time. But he says, but when I have prayed for you, but I have prayed for you. And when you are restored, strengthen your brothers. Satan, the devil, is still God's devil. He is under God's authority. He can combat, he can contest, but he cannot compete with God. If you compete, that means one of the two of you is going to win and, and gain the prize. Satan can't compete with God. He can attack him. He can contest him. He can do all he can to try, to try to thwart the things that God is going to do. But he has no authority apart from what God has given him. Because in Matthew 28, Jesus said, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority, all authority, where? has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Everything is mine. I own everything. I am absolutely the ruler, the authority over everything. And in John 12, he said, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Well, only someone with power can cast out the ruler of this world, which Satan had been given the right to. But he said, now the ruler of this world has been cast out. Satan is under the dominion of God. In Matthew 8, the demoniac, the demons cried out saying, what business do we have with each other, son of God? So they knew who he was. They recognized him. And they needed to, to confront him, to speak to him, because they knew that they were under his authority. It says, what do we have to do with each other, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? They know their end. Are you going to torment us now? I mean, we thought we still had some time left. And, and so they, they know you have the power and you can torment us. You can destroy us, absolutely. And there must have been terror in those demons because they knew who it was they were facing. And so they're pleading for some relief from him. And so it says they began to entreat him. You only entreat someone who has superiority to you. Oh, please, please. They're entreating him saying, if you are going to cast us out, you with all authority to do what you want, then send us into the herd of swine. How did they get there? Because Jesus said, yes, I allow it. I permit it. I, it's not the culmination of time yet. You aren't, I'm not here to, to bring final judgment on you but I still have authority. You will come out of him, and yes, you are permitted to go there. Everything at the permission of Christ. 1 Corinthians 
And then comes the end. And he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. Who? Christ. He abolishes the rule, the power, the authority, whether it be of man, whether it be of angelic beings. All power is abolished when the end comes. And who is the one that does that? It is Christ. And then lastly, in Revelation 20, and the devil who deceived them, deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. In the end, Satan is completely subject to Christ and he will be judged and he will be cast into the lake of fire. There is no hope for him. Satan is completely under the authority of God. He had to get permission to do what he did to Job. Satan has much more power than you and I, but he's under the control and the authority of God. So God rules over mankind. He is sovereign over all kings, all nations, all empires, all governments, all people groups. He controls all things of a spiritual nature. And Satan is subject to what God dictates that he can do and will eventually be completely judged and cast into hell. God is, and I love the word that we use, almighty. He is almighty God. He is all-powerful God. There is nothing that can stand before God. He is the absolute ruler, the absolute authority, the one who has dominion over all things. But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases, Psalm 115 says. So then looking back at some of those significant things that Psalm 2 told us, why are the nations in an uproar? It's like, don't they know? Don't they know who they're dealing with? Why are they in an uproar? What do they really think they can do? And why are the peoples devising a vain thing? Doesn't matter what you do. You can't contest God. It will be vanity for you to do so. It goes on to say that the kings of the earth, they take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed Christ, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. We don't want their rule. Let's just cut the cord, break the chains, throw off the authority of God. No, we rule ourselves. We are the ones who are in control. And what does God say? How does he react? Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. What is a decree? It's an, it's an, uh, an official declaration of what will occur. And God has decreed certain things. And he has stated, this is how it's going to be. There's nothing you can do, no appeal you can make. Speaking to the anointed one, it says, and you shall break them. With the rod of iron, you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Come on, think rationally. He's saying, think rationally. Look at who you're dealing with. Show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. And do homage to the Son that he not become angry and you perish in the way. That's going to be the final result for those who stand against the Lord because it says his wrath may soon be kindled but how blessed are all those who take refuge in him you can either stand before God's wrath or you can stand under his protection and the only way we can stand under his protection is through Christ there is nothing that man can do there's nothing that man has to say before God so God is sovereign over all these things and he's sovereign in all of history Again, Daniel 2 said, he is the one who changes times and he changes epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. All of history is under the control of God. 
I like something that we were listening to yesterday, talking about history or reading yesterday, that, that history is not circular. And although certain things occur as we've seen in the past, history is linear. History began at a particular time, and it will end at a particular time, and God is in control, in control of that whole timeline. Everything is under his administration. Isaiah 46 says, Remember the former things long past, for I am God. There is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. And here he says, Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. He didn't just say, I know the end. He says, declaring the end from the beginning. He's the one who is, makes the determination of what man does, what he doesn't do, how far man's control is extended. His purposes, he says, will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So God not only created the stage, and again, it's not just a deist mentality that, okay, here you go, do what you will. Nature, do what you will. Man, do what you will. No, God not only put people on the stage, but he is the one who has really written the script. It combines man's will, obviously, that man makes decisions on his own, has certain rights and privileges, but it's still under God's ultimate direction. In the Baptist Confession, it says this, God's providence, and that word, of course, providence means God's actual oversight and determining what's going to happen. It means provide, see, before, is what those two words, pro and vide, mean. So in God's providence over sinful actions does not occur by just simple permission. Instead, God most wisely and powerfully limits and in other ways arranges and governs even sinful actions. We'll look at Joseph. Joseph, you know what he told his brothers at the end of all of that. He said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And when he says the word meant, he meant predetermined. He is the one who not just somehow allowed that to happen? No, he meant it. He determined it. You meant it for evil. You're evil. That was evil. It was wrong. It was sin. And yet God used your sinful actions for his ultimate purposes. Romans 11 says, for God has shut up all in disobedience. He's shut everybody up in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? We're all under the influence and the power of sin. We've, we've all been shut up under disobedience to God. And yet in all that, he did that, that he might show mercy and grace and the glory of God in salvation. The mind of the Lord can see this, and who can understand it? It's unsearchable. It's beyond our ability to comprehend. And yet God has somehow orchestrated sin, man's choices, yet under his authority and power and use for his own purposes. And as we know, Romans 8, 28 says that all things work together for good. Well, if it's all things, then this must include people and circumstances who are not of God and yet have an effect on the people of God. So there's nothing that can come into a believer's life that God has not ordained, allowed, even if it's coming from some godless source. Whatever circumstance we're in, situation we're in, the people that we encounter, God still uses all things, all things for the good of those who love him. And are called according to his purpose. Proverbs 16 says, The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. He has determined that. Satan didn't win the day and raised up some evil that then God had to come back somehow and figure out how to defeat this thing. God has raised up even the wicked for the day of evil. 
God raised up Egypt. God raised up Babylon. God raised up Persia. He raised up Assyria. He used these people. We see him say this in the Old Testament, how he used those groups for his own purposes, to judge his people, to bring about the ends that he had already determined. And in Daniel 2, Daniel interprets the king's dream by foretelling the rise of the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of Persia, of Greece, and of Rome. This was before any of those happened. And yet he is already saying, this will come, and this will come, and this one will overtake this one. God had determined that. He had ordained that these nations and these kings exist in order to fulfill the purposes that he had. Striking verse right here in John 19. So Pilate said to Jesus, you do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you? And I have authority to crucify you? And who do you think you are, carpenter man? Do you know who I am? Do you know the empire I represent? <laughs> who are you? Jesus says, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. Who do you think you are, Pilate? I'm the Lord of the universe. The Roman Empire is nothing to me. But because I have chosen this, because this is what God has allowed and ordained, it's happening the way it's happening. Even the evil that you are, even the evil of the Jewish nation, God is using that. God's providence. It's the working out of his plan. It's the specifics, in other words, that lead to the end. It's the events, the encounters. It's the turns in the journey. All of that, God is orchestrating. The smallest details to the grandest design, whatever. He is the one who orchestrates, and his providence determines the outcome. Look at Judas. Jesus says, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. He called all 12 of them, he said, and he said, but yet one of you is a devil. He knew exactly what he was doing when he called Judas, and why. He has ordained even the wicked for the day of evil. Judas was not some kind of a mistake or that... Judas failed to see the plan somehow and made a bad choice. But that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, the son of perdition had to come and I had to choose him. And then you go on again about Judas as Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. I chose that devil just like I chose the rest of you. It's a powerful thought. God's sovereignty and how he uses all things, even sin and wickedness, for his own purposes. But such a beautiful explanation of it we see in Acts 2. Peter preaching to the crowds. So here's this man that was cowering a few weeks earlier. Now he's standing up in front of the entire city proclaiming the gospel. And he says, this man, speaking of Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Who crucified Jesus? Oh, physically, the Romans. Who ordained that it happened? God. Said he, the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross, how? By the hands of godless men, and you put him to death. God took godless men, the hatred, the anger, the authority of the day, all of that together according to God's preordained plan that it might be accomplished. The Lord reigns is what he's saying. The Lord reigns. If you go to Psalm, I believe it's between 96 and 99, you'll see that repeated over and over. The Lord reigns. As a reminder, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. However you emphasize it, it's God absolutely in control of everything. Job said, I know that you can do all things and that no purposes, purpose of yours can be thwarted because you're God, because you reign. In Psalm 33, 
It says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. No one can stay the hand of God. No one can compete with God. He is the absolute sovereign over all. As our opening verse said, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His sovereignty rules over all. Well, God, give us grace. Oh, to see you more as you are, to know you, not just to see it, but to know you, to seek to have an intimate knowledge of you that, that, that then we, we are united with you, that, that we have the mind of Christ that then brings the word of God to our understanding and, and has authority and power in us that we know the sovereign of all the universe. Oh God, this, this does just blow our minds. We, we cannot and we never could comprehend it, but we want to have a greater glimpse. As Mo, Moses said, show me your glory, Lord. Show us your glory. Display yourself. Reveal these truths and let it then bring a conviction upon us that, that affects how we think, what we do, how we live, how we respond. Oh God, give grace that we would know you, that you would be honored in that, that we would worship you more rightly, that we would live before you more appropriately. Thank you, God, for your mercy, because none of this comes except you reveal it. Please be gracious to reveal yourself more and more to us that we might know you, love you, serve you, honor you as your creatures should. The one sovereign Lord over all. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing.